Biological Information, the book. Uh, there's a book out uh, just last year called Biological Information, New Perspectives. Um, the editors are some people that uh, those of you who have been following the intelligent design uh, movement will recognize most of them, including uh, Bangladesh John Sanford, who's actually been here at the Sabbath School. Uh, it was published by World Scientific Publication, um, and uh, this was in 2013. Uh, it was the proceedings of a symposium held May 31 through June 30, 2011, and it was supposed to be published in 2012. So we see there, there's some interesting reasons why that didn't happen. Uh, and if you want the book, um, you can download all of the chapters for free. Now the book itself costs $178. So on Amazon you can get it for $145. So it's 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 obviously a limited edition, but they did not want the information to be stuck where the book is. So uh well, I bought a copy anyway because I wanted to support the company and I think it'll be evident as we go along why. Um, that's what the book looks like on the front. Um, there are four parts to the book besides the little miscellaneous information that you get in the index and stuff. Uh, there's the general introduction which we'll cover today. There's biological information and genetic theory. There's uh, theoretical molecular biology. Yeah. I'll just move this out of the way because you can't see it anyway. And there's biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. Biological information, um, we start with the general so that you can get a flavor of what the book's about. Biological information, though still in its infancy as a field of study, is widely thought to be well understood in its broad outlines. The conventional or old perspective on biological information is this. Biological information in the first instance originates through purely chemical processes. These processes produce the first replicators. Once replication is in place, the Darwinian process of natural selection acting on random variations kicks in, continually increasing the information content of these replicators. Eventually, the information generating power of chemical and Darwinian processes results in organisms as complex and sophisticated as human beings. I will not be reading this word for word. And uh, where you see yellow dots and stuff, that's my own comments. Um, this is not the proceedings. Pardon me? This is not the proceedings of the conference. It's put together by creation. This is actually the proceedings of the conference. Okay. okay. Well, you know, probably polished up a little bit here and there. Uh, but, but the papers were all the same papers that were presented. Um, this perspective on biological information is a majority position in the scientific community. Often it fails to be fully articulated. Skipping a little bit. Nonetheless, one occasionally finds this perspective articulated not in pieces, but fully. Nobel laureate and origin of life researcher Christian de Duve is a case in point. In his book Vital Dust, he lays out the various ages in the history of life, the age of chemistry, the age of information, the age of the protocell, the age of the single cell, etc. Note that chemistry starts the ball rolling and precedes information. Dr. de Duve elaborates. History is a continuous process that we divide in retrospect into ages. The Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, each characterized by a major innovation added to previous accomplishments. This is true also of the history of life. First, there is the age of chemistry. It covers the formation of a number of major constituents of life up to the first nucleic acids and is ruled entirely by the universal principles that govern the behavior of atoms and molecules. Then comes the age of information, thanks to the development of special information-bearing processes that inaugurated the new process of Darwinian evolution and natural selection peculiar to the living world. Well, that's Duduv's um, comments. Uh, the book goes on, the conventional perspective on biological information tends more often to be articulated in pieces. 
Thus, Harvard chemist uh, George Whitesides, following, focusing on his expertise in chemistry, speaks to the origin of life and thus to the origin of the first biological information. This problem, that is the problem of life's origin, is one of the big ones in science. It begins to place life and us in the universe. Most chemists believe, as I do, that life emerged spontaneously from mixtures of molecules in the prebiotic earth. How? I have no idea. Note that confession and then note the next comment. Though short on details, Whitesides is nonetheless confident that his perspective is correct. I believe that understanding the cell is ultimately a question of chemistry and that chemists are, in principle, best qualified to solve it. The cell is a bag, a bag containing smaller bags and a helpfully organizing spaghetti. Filled with a jello of reacting chemicals and somehow able to re replicate itself. Now, lest you think that this was dug out uh, in the 1950s, like George Wald's famous statement, you'll notice that the reference is from 2007. Fairly up to date. Just amazing. I have no idea how it happened, but we know it happened this way. And ask yourself how they know. Um, I, I would suggest possibly by faith. Once life has originated and biological information is on hand, the subsequent history of life displays massive increases in information content. To explain these increases, and we've gotten through the origin of life, um, the conventional perspective on biological information takes a thoroughly Darwinian line. Elevating natural selection is the primary engine for information generation over the course of biological evolution. Richard Dawkins articulates this view as follows. In every generation, natural selection removes the less successful genes from the gene pool. So the remaining gene pool is a narrower subset. Notice we're gaining information by losing it. The narrowing is non-random in the direction of improvement, whereas where improvement is defined in the Darwinian way as improvement in fitness to survive and reproduce. Of course, the total range of variation is topped up again in every generation by new mutation and other kinds of variation. But it still remains true that natural selection is narrowing down from an initially wider field of possibilities, including mostly unsuccessful ones, to a narrower field of successful ones. This is analogous to the definition of information with which we began. Information is what enables the narrowing down from prior uncertainty, the, origin, the initial range of possibilities, to later certainty, the successful choice among the prior probabilities. According to this analogy, natural selection by definition a pro is by definition a process whereby information is fed into the gene pool of the next generation. This is the conventional or old perspective of the origin, on the origin and evolution of biological information. All the contributors to this volume question this perspective. In its place, they propose various new perspectives, plural. Some take a clearly teleological approach, advocating intelligent agent causation as the ultimate source of biological information. Others view information as sui generis, one of a kind, um, as a fundamental entity not reproducible to purely material factors such as chemical attraction and natural selection. And others, while still, while accepting a big chunk of the old perspective, think that it needs to be supplemented with self-organizational processes whose information gather, uh, generating powers transcend those of the old perspective. The contributors, rather than presenting a united front, attempt to explore new ground and ask insightful new questions. Among other people at the conference were Stuart Kaufman, for example. Um, definitely not a theist, definitely not even an um, a, uh, aliens did it type of person. But if the old perspective is so well established, why question it? Is it not a sign of recalcitrance to contradict well-settled varieties, verities of the scientific community? Certainly this can be a danger, but it is a danger only when those raising the questions are ill-informed and unqualified in the relevant sciences and have as their main motive to derail rather than foster genuine scientific inquiry. That is not the case with any of these contributors 
any of the contributors to this volume. Science progresses not by acceding to consensus, but by breaking with it. Moreover, even with well-settled scientific theories, it is healthy for science periodically to question whether those theories really hold up. Um, science does not have a priesthood or a canon. In any case, there are good reasons, readily accessible to non-experts, for thinking that the old perspective on biological information bears closer scrutiny and may well be false. Take the origin of life, where all biological information begins. Origin of life researchers readily admit that they don't know how life began. True, they entertain speculative ideas about life's origin, with RNA worlds currently heading the pack, but no one in the field claims to have a precisely formulated theory with solid evidential support that explains life's origins. Thus, Stuart Kaufman, a contributor to this volume, writes, anyone who tells you that he or she knows how life started on the Earth some 3.45 billion years ago is a fool or a knave. Nobody knows. How's that for categorical? Um, origin of life re researcher Leslie o Orgel, who is now dead as I understand, similarly held that anyone, quote, anyone who thinks they know the solution to this problem is deluded, end quote. Or consider science writer Paul Davies. We are a very long way from comprehending the how of life's origin. This gulf in understanding is not merely ignorance about certain technical details. It is a major conceptual lacuna. My personal belief, for what it is worth, is that a fully satisfactory theory of the origin of life demands some radically new ideas. None of those three, by the way, as far as I know, are theists. The origin of life is the most vexing problem facing contemporary science. Could it be that although chemistry provides the medium for biological information, the information itself constitutes a message capable of writing free from the underlying medium? Could such information be a real entity, as real as the chemical constituents that embody it, and yet not, reproducib not reducible to them? and dare we say, have an intelligent cause. Granted, this is itself a speculative possibility, but in a field so rife with speculation, why allow only one set of speculations, those that adhere to the old perspective, and disallow others, those that open up new possibilities? The contributors to this volume are not offering final answers. Rather, they are raising penetrating questions precisely where the old perspective has failed to offer a promising starting point for understanding the origin of biological information. Even so, once biological information comes on the scene at the origin of the first life, uh, don't we have a well-supported theory for the increase of biological information via the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection acting on random variations? In fact, even here the old perspective on biological information comes up short. The problem, as University of Chicago molecular biologist James Shapiro notes in Evolution, a view from the 21st century, is that Darwini Darwinism constitutes an oversimplification. Molecular evidence about genome sequence change changes, tells us that the simplifying assumptions made in the 19th and early 20th centuries are plainly wrong. They fail to account for the variety of cellular and genomic events we now know to have occurred. Shapiro continues. Living cells and organisms are cognizant, uh, cognitive, sentient entities that act and interact purposefully to ensure survival, growth, and pro proliferation. They possess corresponding sensory communication, information processing, and decision-making capabilities. Cells are built to evolve. They have the ability to alter their hereditary characteristics rapidly through well-described natural genetic engineering and epigenetic processes as well as cell mergers. The picture of life and evolution that Shapiro presents is radically at odds with the old perspective on biological information. Shapiro is not alone. Many biologists are now questioning whether conventional evolutionary theory needs to be rethought from the ground up, notably the Altenberg 16, who started out as mainstream biologists, wedded to the old perspective, but now have jumped ship because the old perspective is no longer working, at least not for them. So too, notable outsiders are beginning to question whether the old perspective is, is disintegrating before their very eyes. 
this Robert Laughlin, a Nobel laureate physicist who studies the properties of matter that make life possible, remarks, evolution by natural selection, for instance, which Charles Darwin originally conceived as a great theory, has lately come to function more as an anti-theory. Called up to cover up embarrassing experimental shortcomings and legitimate findings that are at best questionable and at worst even wrong. Your protein defies the laws of mass action? Evolution did it. Your complicated mess of chemical reactions turns into a chicken? Evolution. The human brain works on logical principles no computer can emulate? Evolution is the cause. Obviously, he's somewhat skeptical, and as you can see, I'm skipping a little bit here. Even Francisco Ayala, an otherwise staunch neo-Darwinist, now questions whether evolutionary theory requires fundamental new insights. Unfortunately, there's a lot, lot, lot to be discovered still. To reconstruct evolutionary theory, we have to know how the mechanisms operate in detail, and we have only the vaguest idea of how they operate at the genetic level, how genetic change relates to development and to function. I am implying that what would be discovered would, not, would be not only details, but some major principles. Stop and think, this is the same Ayala, who is defending evolution against Michael Behe. You have heard it said that the uh, that evolutionary theory has pretty much answered the question of how the flagellum, for example, was made step by step. Alice says, no, we don't have those kinds of answers. In the spring of 2011, a diverse group of scientists gathered at Cornell University. These scientists include experts in information theory, computer science, numerical simulation, simulation, thermodynamics, evolutionary theory, whole organism biology, developmental biology, molecular biology, genetics, physics, biophysics, mathematics, and linguistics. Original scientific research was presented and discussed at the symposium, which was then written up and constitute most of the 24 peer uh, edited papers in this volume. These papers are presented in four sections, and we went through the four sections earlier. Each of these sections begins with an introductory chapter laying out the themes and problems to be discussed there as well providing, I'm sure that should be as well as, providing brief summaries of the papers appearing in that section. Many of the papers in this volume speak of biological information in the limited context of the multidimensional array of information encoded within a cell's genome. Nevertheless, if we define information more broadly as all that is, that w all that which is communicated, um, the information within a living cell is much greater than its DNA sequence. It is recognized that there are hundreds of thousands of different types of interactions within the cell's interactome, and most of these interactions in one way or another involve communication. In this sense, the amazing communication network within a cell can very reasonably be compared to the Internet. While many of the papers given at this symposium deal with information within the genome, it is very important we do not forget that most biological information in the cell is above and beyond the genome. On a level entirely above and beyond all this communicated information within the cell, information is also being communicated between cells and between organisms. On a still higher level, we have the little understood biological information that underlies the human mind, our own intelligence and human consciousness. All of this is biological information. There exists an unknown number of symbolic languages, the genetic code being just one of many biological codes, underlying this astounding communication labyrinth, integrating all levels of biological information. All this talk about information as a real object of study within the field of biology, however, raises the question, what exactly is information in the first place? Is it a precisely defined measurable entity? As the University of Texas philosophy of biology, Sabotra Sarkar rightly notes, it is incumbent upon those who think that informational concepts have a theoretical value in biology, that is, they explain things rather than being mere, merely metaphors, to produce an appropriate technical concept of information in, for biological contexts. 
The first section of this volume is devoted to precisely this concern. King off research on evolutionary search, no free lunch theorems, and conservation of information, this section attempts to provide the theoretical underpinnings for a full-fledged theory of biological information. In the last decades, it has become clear that biological information is crucial to our understanding of life. On completion of the Human Genome Project, former Caltech president and Nobel Prize winning biologist David Baltimore remarked, Modern biology is a science of information. The sequencing of the genome is a landmark of progress in specifying the information, decoding it into its many coded, decoding it into its many coded meanings, and learning how it goes wrong in disease. While it is a moment worthy of the attention of every human, we should not mistake progress for a solution. There is yet much hard work to be done. The contributors to this volume agree and desire that their efforts here will inspire much hard work on the greater project of providing a full-fledged theory of biological information, one that is free of ideological bias and gets at the truth of the matter. That is briefly the introduction to the book. And it gives you a, an idea of the overview of what the book's about and why they um, came or why they, why they uh, view things the way they do. Um, I'm going to talk now about what happened to people who really didn't like the book. Most of whom, have, of course, had never read it, but knew what it must contain, and so therefore it must be shut down. Um, this first one is uh, Wesley Elsberry, and you can see the website. Um, Around June 4, 2011, the usual gaggle of anti-evolutionists held a closed invitation-only meeting in a rented space at Cornell University. The putative topic, putative? The topic of the discussion was biological information. After the conference, they set about getting their conference papers. Why the quotes? I mean, they were, they were papers published by a scientific publisher. In various places around the web, little bits of discussion turned up describing how detractors and critics had been kept out, that the unadulterated anti-evolution objections would be published by a major publisher not yet to be named, and that all that was needed for this plan to come to fruition was to keep the publisher's name quiet until the, vol until the volume was printed. Uh, last week, the major scientific publisher was revealed to be Springer Verlag. Springer automatically generated pre-publication announcements for forthcoming books. So in the course of time going on, the book description popped up on Springer's website and on Amazon.com. The cat was out of the bag. Nick Matsky posted on Panda's Thumb that Springer had managed to get suckered by a bunch of batch of creationists. Within 24 hours, the Springer page for the book was taken down. Wow. In news reports, Springer said that the editorial staff was sending the material out for further review. And uh, it's interesting to ask the question, by whom? On the Discovery Institute blog, an Egypt post complaining about censorship went up momentarily, was crawled by the Googlebot, and then was taken down. Somebody on the religious anti-evolution side of the fence figured out, belatedly, that the best shot at get pretty, getting pretty much what they had thought they had in the bag would be aided by not stirring up controversy themselves. And so, and the word appears to be going out to the faithful that it should be so. The various places where gloating comments about the conference and subsequent publication suddenly had the comments or posts pulled. Anything that can provide a record for the intentional subterfuge and misleading material provided to Springer is being expunged even now. Now, misleading, intentional subterfuge. See, he knows that it's there even though he hasn't actually seen it. So in this thread, uh, so this thread is open to archive and preserve that record as best we can manage. Scraping sources from Google Catch to Internet Archive. Please post any finds you make here. Basically, he doesn't want these, th these comments to disappear. And we'll go over a few of them. One comment that was preserved for posterity. Um, 
I had promised you that the two papers I co-authored would soon be published, remember? Well, publication has occurred and release is supposed to be very soon, within days. However, we may be witnessing in real time another episode for, of Expelled. The proceedings from the symposium, this is comments by a pro person being quoted by the antis. The proceedings from the symposium contained in a book biolog titled Biological Information New Perspectives is now encountering the usual attempts at censorship practiced by the thought police. You know, the type of censorship the, that the evil faithful loudly deny happens at all. This is strictly a scientific symposium. I know I was there from start to finish. Every paper was scrutinized to remain, be, remain science, pure science. The publisher is Springer Verlag. I assure you that the papers were heavily peer, heavily peer reviewed. But guess what? They now want to do additional peer review because of complaints. The evil faithful complain that intelligent design isn't science because it isn't peer reviewed. When it is peer reviewed, they say it shouldn't have been peer reviewed because it's not science. Now, where did I put my shotgun? I'm not sure what that statement is supposed to mean, that last one. In passing, do you see why I use the term dishonest as often as I do? Do you, huh? Do you? It fits. Lastly, want to guess who's already involved? Yep, you guessed it, the NCSE, the witch in her broomstick. More details here, and apparently that was at one time a, a, a good link. NCSE. Pardon me? What's NCSE? Uh, National Center for Science Education. Eugenie Scott is obviously the witch. I'm sorry? Oakland. Oakland. Yeah. California, yeah. This could turn ugly, very ugly. Stay tuned. And Jorge. I, I'm presuming that's Jorge Fernandez, but we don't know for sure. Um, and here's some of the comments from the antagonists themselves. The book was mistakenly, tentatively accepted by some junior editors at Springer based on the Cornell name. When the truth of the matter became clear, Springer pulled advance, the advance notice of the book. I will just comment that uh, the first sentence uh, has a couple of errors. Um, as someone who has publicly, another comment in the same vein, as someone who has publicly commented on this issue, I find Jorge's shotgun comment above to be a palpable threat. I consider this fair use of his commentary. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why if we ever make comments, we need to be very, very careful that we don't use hyperbole in any way, uh, or certainly not in ways that could be misunderstood. As you can see, um, they will be misunderstood whether del deliberately or accidentally, I'll leave to your um, uh, choice. And then an another comment. Uh, again, from the anti people, Eric Merkel so Sobata, Executive Vice President of Corporate Communications at Springer in Germany, said in an email that the initial proposal for the book was peer reviewed by two independent reviewers. I want you to notice that it was peer reviewed. However, once the complete manuscript had been submitted, the series editors became aware that additional peer review would be necessary. Unspoken, Somewhere in between here, there were people hollering, hey, you can't publish this. Remember, never have seen the book. Merkel Sabata said, this is currently underway and the automatically generated pre-announcement for the book on Springer has been removed until the peer reviewers have made their final decision. So basically Springer took it back, went to review it again, took their time reviewing it. Um, here's another comment from uh, somebody, uh, Bill O'Hara, and the address is uh, there. Um, as the contents of the volume are typical ID creationist subjects, how did this book get accepted by Springer Verlag? Presumably, the proposal to have the book published didn't mention ID nor creationism. But what did it say? Now, this is the interesting thing. 
presumably it didn't mention it. They have no way of knowing. As a matter of fact, as we will see, it did. Um, presumably it would have been more detailed than the book's blurb and would have probably have listed the proposed chapters and authors. I think this would have been spotted rather quickly by biologists, so sending the proposal to an engineering computer science editor makes sense. Only it wasn't sent to an, edi uh, an editor, as we will see. But who were the reviewers? Marks II and company would have provided some suggestions, presumably their friends, but did Springer ask anyone else? And did the query of the, uh, they query the book's suitability for their intelligent systems selection? Now, I'm going to go over one major uh, point that the protagonists have raised. There are at least two other ones, uh, posts that discuss this in some detail by people who know what's going on. And this one can be found at evolutionnews.org. Um, and the first uh, major title inside of that is Springer invites William Dembski to submit a book proposal. And they detailed the reason why. So the interaction with Springer didn't start because Dembski reached out to them, but rather because Dembski was invited by an editor at Springer to submit a proposal. Notice, all of those suspicious about how they carefully went to the engineering department. No. Somebody at Springer thought William Dembski might have something, and Dembski said, oh, that's interesting. And around that, the conference was organized. December 2010, Biological Information New Perspectives Conference uh, organizers submit book proposal to Springer. In the subsequent e weeks and months, Springer completed its review of the book. Uh, this, I'm, the, uh, I'm picking out paragraphs and titles, not the whole thing, because we'd be here all day if I did that. Um, in the subsequent weeks and months, Springer completed its review of the book proposal and fully accepted it as seen from the fact that they offered a book contract to Dembski on January 11, 2011. That contract was then signed by both parties. A revised contract with a few minor changes dated March 23, 2011 was signed by the authors and Springers a few months later. Uh, February 2012, Darwin Lobby mounts a campaign to scuttle the book, of uh, which you read part of that campaign. General happiness between Springer and the book's Editors continued until the end of February 2012. At that time, the book was very close to final publication with Springer. So close that Springer pub posted a page about the book on its website where the volume could be ordered online. See here for a screenshot. Amazon had also begun selling the book. See the Amazon screenshot. And listed the publication date as March 31, 2012. They were within a month and maybe, you know, in the end of February to March 31 month and a few days of getting it actually published. Uh, again, we're going to skip over some stuff. In an, an attempt to distance themselves from the book, Springer later claimed the page on its own website was auto-generated. But as will become clear soon, it's hard to believe anything they're saying about the situation. It would be even harder to believe that Amazon auto-generated a sales page about Springer's book. The exact details on this point are immaterial because it seems that Springer was happy and eager to start selling copies of biological information, new perspectives, proceedings as of late February 2012. Around this time, the ever-vigilant Darwin Lobby apparently saw these pages and eventually passed notification along to Nick Matsky. At this point, Nick Ma Mr. Matsky had some choices to make. He's now, I understand, Dr. Matsky. Um, it's no secret that he disagrees with intelligent design, a viewpoint that he's fully entitled to hold, and one that I would defend his academic freedom to hold and express in academic settings. Two of his main choices were roughly as follows. A, do nothing, because it's not his place to try to censor those he disagrees with, especially interfering when his opponents had a good faith contract with a major book publisher. Or B, mount a public relations, a public campaign to pressure, bully, and embarrass Springer into canceling publication of the book. Mr. Matsky went with option B. Thus, on February 27, 2012, 
Maskey published a blog post at Pandas Thumb titled Springer Gets Suckered by Creationist Pseudoscience, hoping to bully Springer into abandoning the book. He wrote, the major publishers have enough problems at the moment. See the Elsevier boycott. It seems like the last thing they should be doing is frittering away their credibility even further by uncritically publishing creationist work and giving it a veneer of respectability. The mega publishers are expensive, making money off of largely government funded work provided to them for free, and then the public doesn't even have access to it. The only thing they have going for them is quality control and credibility. If they give that away to cranks, there's no reason at all to support them. Nice little publishing business you have there. Be a shame if anything were to happen to it. <coughs> but Ellsbury's calls to persecution led, uh, led to all kinds of silly errands such as digging up and quoting from Professor Mark's wife's 2011 Christmas uh, letter about their family trip to Cornell University for the conference, which led one commenter who calls himself Doc Bill to say, wow, almost makes them seem human. Almost. And that's what they want you to think. As if Professor Marx instructed his wife that I want you to slip this into the Christmas card so that everybody will think that we're really nice people when we're really planning to turn the scientific community on its ear. The paranoia of these people is just amazing. Springer made some false statements, and one of the false statements was that the review was underway before the hubbub. No, the hubbub came before this additional need for review. And number two was that Springer was unaware that the book had connections to intelligent design. Now, it's very possible that the higher-ups at Springer didn't know. They certainly didn't know uh, that, the, that certain sections of the academic community uh, would be violently opposed to their publishing this book. I think that um, they thought this is just something else we can publish. Um, anyway, th from March to December of 2012, Springer Stonewall uh, broke its word and set up the book for failure. Basically, they peer-reviewed it by people who didn't like it. And... Um, and then said, no, we can't publish this book. Um, at this point, one might wonder why the authors didn't sue. They almost did. But there was a major unjust barrier to a lawsuit. Springer Verlag is based in Germany, and its boilerplate clause in the contract sa said that in the case of a dispute, quote, the courts of Berlin, Germany, shall have the exclusive jurisdiction. This meant that the authors, who were academics of limited financial means, found it that it would be would have been financially unfeasible and extremely difficult to pursue a potentially long, costly, and drawn-out lawsuit in Germany, just as isn't cheap or easily obtained. And unfortunately, the author simply couldn't afford to Germany, uh, couldn't afford going to Germany to get it. The, uh, the authors then decided to simply seek other publishers. Ultimately, they published the book with World Scientific Publishing, and that's where we are today. This is a story of pernicious censorship, but it's also a story in which the Darwin lobby's attempt at censorship ultimately failed. And you can get it from World Publishing, World Scientific Publishing. And um, in fact, they have gone to the unusual step of allowing you to get the PDFs for every chapter on the internet. You can theoretically publish it yourself. You can read it for free. Now, my take of, we'll, we'll see how strong the arguments in the book are. But the reaction is interesting because the reaction came before anybody had actually seen the arguments. And it seems to indicate that those reacting believe it is more useful to refuse to allow anyone to see the arguments than to refute them straight up. One can ask why this calculation is made. 
Now, this one other point I think you need to keep in mind, we need to be careful that we do not imitate the reactors. Suppression of information is not an appropriate way to go in this kind of situation. But that's my take. Now it's your turn. In this, I, I see absolute arrogance and not ignorance. They're absolutely arrogant. They believe that the bully pul pulpit is theirs, no matter what. No matter what you say, you're a scientist or whatever, the bully pul pulpit is ours. And uh, what do the kids know in high school and what do they care? Or in colleges, the publishers have no other choice. So the equivalence of the IRS and FBI or whatever is going to be on their side. And uh, the ones who are believers are fools. And how dare they, perhaps, this is what they're saying. How mm -hmm. dare they? This is mm -hmm. very sad. And uh, they also have the strength of, uh, I believe that, uh, that evolution is, uh, is uh, uh, state-funded, government-funded, uh, system that no one else can. So uh, our tax money, in, in fact, goes into that. And uh, that's very sad. And uh, I see them total arrogance. How dare you question? Any other comments? Mm -hmm. uh, I simply comment, my comment is uh, what should be our reaction to this as Christians, as seeking to help God redeem as many as possible, as uh, seeking to promote truth and so on. Uh, I mean, we, this goes on all the time. This is not <clears throat> an isolated case. It is, uh, we're in a situation where uh, you've got a mindset, you've got a worldview that dominates, and it's uh, prompted by or promote, I shouldn't say prompted or promoted, it's, it's supported by a very successful scientific enterprise. Uh, and so uh, you're in kind of a, uh, you're kind of caught in a, in a situation here where you've got this. Uh, <clears throat> Can you send the mic back? Paradigm going on. Uh, and refusal to open the door type of thing, mentality supported by very successful scientific enterprise. Uh, what, what do you do? Uh, I think that, that's uh, the important question we need to approach here is, uh, It's, you know, and this is an extremely serious issue that this book raises, of course. You know, it's, of course, it's basic. To, it's a basic worldview. Is there a God? Isn't there a God? Uh, so, uh, you know, it, each can try and do what he can. I think it's extremely important that we behave with reason with a certain degree of restraint and a high degree of understanding of what is going on here. Well, I, I suppose that I would say that if there are 
uh, lessons to be learned by us. I think one of them is this is not the way you behave. Um, we have no business trying to threaten other people with don't you dare publish that or we'll do th this to you. Secondly, I think that there's something, there's something underlying it. I really think that these people believe their propaganda, but they're afraid they can't defend it. Um, and they are afraid that they're going to lose power. I think they really are scared. Uh, if you if you read the the people they they see this as a, a uh, uh, as a plot, now I think they're perceiving it wrongly. In that I don't uh, I don't see a lot of plotters trying desperately to um, get them by any means fair or foul. And it's one of the reasons why I think that um, um, that Jorge's shotgun comment was totally out of line. And I would say that to Jorge himself. I'm not sure whether he meant it. I hope he didn't mean it. If he, did, if he meant it, then his thought process is totally out of line, too. Uh, this is not a shotgun situation. But um, the thing you have to keep in mind is that 40% of scientists believe in a God who answers prayer. 45% don't. 15% aren't sure. What that means is that there's a 5% difference. And what happens if that 5% difference switches? Now they're in the minority. I just, just add, uh, and they know how majorities treat minorities because they're doing it right now. We, we, can, we can correct that figure a little bit. Pew Research report that a certain percentage, and I can't give you exact figures, I'm sorry, uh, believe in God and another percentage of scientists, these are scientists, I believe in God, another percentage believe in some kind of deity, and you put those two together, uh, and it's 51%. And you can actually make the statement that over half of the scientists, albeit it's a very slight majority, <laughs> over half of the scientists believe in some kind of deity. Yes, but 40% and believe in a deity that answers prayer. Yeah. And that's a uh, pretty big that, that's statement pretty big. to make. Uh, uh, what that means is that there's, you know, they see themselves as as being threatened. But we see a um, we see a scientific community following a scenario that denies what the majority of that community believes. And you're moving into out of science into sociology and psychology here, uh, and certainly uh, not rationality. Well, this is, uh, in, in political terms, this is kind of like, um, kind of like the situation in apartheid. or apartheid, I guess they're supposed to say it, where, where you're actually looking at it could turn into the minority is, is ruling over the majority and has to do so by terror. And of course, if that happens and they realize that the vote could come out any time, they know they're going to lose. When it becomes the majority, uh, then, then the only way they can stay on top is by keeping everybody in line. Once that stops, it's the end. Um, 
Uh, I would like to uh, second some of these concerns, uh, but there is something that, that was mentioned earlier. I believe Dr. Roth mentioned that uh, science is very successful. Um, and I think that that is true. However, one should distinguish the very successful science which uh, searches for ways in which uh, it could be wrong and grows as a result of that. Uh, that is, in virtually all other aspects of science other than evolutionary thinking. Evolutionary thinking is not allowed to be questioned and so cannot progress. Um, this is a distinction. You see, we should not lump everything into science uh, in one lump and say science is eminently successful. Yes, the rest of the science outside of evolution or when you leave evolution out, then the rest of the science is tremendously successful. But when you think about the progress that evolutionary thinking has made, been, uh, uh, that, that has been made in evolutionary thinking in the last 150 years, I don't see that a great deal has been accomplished. That should be a challenge to the evolutionists themselves. And the fact that they are so threatened by another way of looking at things is the best evidence of the weakness of the foundation on which they stand. They cannot react in this manner and <coughs> expect themselves to be taken seriously. Well, they, they can be expected to take, be taken seriously, um, just not seriously intellectually. So this, so the conference was invited members only and they were all creationists? Oh, no. So what was, uh, the, the, what first, was the basis the for being invited? The first is partly true. The conference invited a number of different people, but it invited people mainly from the, uh, from the perspective of evolution doesn't have all the answers. Standard evolution. Um, they invited people who, s they invited creationists, intelligent design people who are different from creationists, and people who believe in self-organization as at least three different groups. And I think there's a fourth one in there having to be just uh, information is its own thing, uh, but there's no God behind it. At least as I read the uh, as I read the prospectus. Now I have to l look at the individual papers and see, but I do know that Stuart Kaufman and there's somebody else at the end who who are believers in self-organizational complexity theory, which is not creationist or intelligent design or anything re reasonably close to it. But it does say that that standard Darwinian evolution doesn't have the, all the answers. Uh, so these were sort of pre-selected on the willingness to question the dogma. That's right. They were selected on willingness to question the dogma. They were not selected, at least as far as I know, on the answers they would give. If anything, I think they tried to make a broad range of answers so that, uh, so that the book would, would have things from people who, uh, whose perspective was not intelligent design. Uh, I, you can argue that that was done for strategic reasons, but I think they also uh, they wanted to give a fuller perspective to um, evolution doesn't have all the answers, and then where do we go from here? Uh, one more comment, and then since it's getting to be 11:30, I think I'll just let it uh, stop there. I'm watching with interest the Hong Kong situation in which people seem to want a choice of their own and they're demonstrating. I'm paraphrasing a statement for in order for evil to succeed, we only have to have good men do nothing. Wouldn't it be acceptable for us, I say us, I mean you of course, <laughs> to, to make public 
this attempted control of information by a certain element of scientific society. Instinctively, we feel that's not right, that's not fair. And if we could somehow publish the fact that they're controlling information that should be coming to us to give us a choice, I think we'd throw the bums out. Um, that's one of the reasons for the movie Expelled. Um, so I think it's fair to say that some people are trying. We're having this, this will be published, so there's another uh, one. Um, you'll notice that there was a reaction from the Discovery Institute to this that laid out in some detail. I didn't go anywhere near the detail I could have uh, as to what transpired when and, and who was reacting to whom and who said things afterwards that didn't jive with the facts ahead of time. Um, uh, you can see, I, I think, corporate fear. The Darwin lobby is coming to get us. We will be ruined. We will not be able to publish anything else because they will make sure to steer all publications away from us. And they will ruin our good name. And so they had to farm it out. The most interesting I think, I think was, is that this book is available from Springer on ebook. Yes. So uh, now, I didn't actually test it. So it's possible that that's uh, sitting out there. But apparently, the, the thing that went down has gone back up. And you can actually buy it from Springer on ebook. Um, I didn't e actually look at it. I don't think it'll be anywhere near the price of the of the hard copy for the simple reason that um, that if if you can get if you can download the PDFs for each chapter, uh, obviously getting the ebook is just a convenience, so they can't charge too much for it. But it's out there. Uh, it's also available on ebook uh, by World uh, Scientific Publishing. And of course, the Darwin lobby is busy now telling us that World Scientific Publishing is a vanity publishing affair. A what? It's a vanity publishing affair. You know, you publish stuff because you pay them enough money and they don't really care about the scientific val validity of it. Well, I mean, it has to be true, doesn't it? After all, they published this, and it's, everybody knows this is total rot. <laughs> the logic is just amazing. Who was the publisher of The Origin of the Species? I don't know. Was it a great scientific publishing company? I don't oh, think so. But you see, you see, this is all an attempt to delegitimize this. That's the whole point. You have to delegitimize it because once it's legitimate, then you have to ask, answer the questions, and you can't do it, and they know that. But anyway. Anyway, next week we'll dive into the information section and uh, I hope that you'll be edified.